Well, it's good to be back with you this evening. How many of you think that you have survived the time change? You think you have survived it? All right. If you feel kind of strange on the, the Sunday evening service of time change, it's just normal. It's just normal. It happens, unfortunately, every year. And so it would be nice. I would actually vote for just stopping this madness. <laughs> just, just putting it mildly. But uh, so I'm, I'm thankful that many of you ventured back tonight. And what I'm really thankful for is everybody seems like they've pretty much for the most part moved one row forward, which is kind of nice. Uh, I don't feel so alone up here. <laughs> And so it's good to be with you tonight. I'd like to invite your attention to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The title of the message this evening is Run All. Run All. And you'll see uh, where we get that from. It's right out of the Bible, that, that uh, title. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Since it's 1 Corinthians, we know that this is the first letter uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth. That's why it's labeled that way. So he's writing to an already existing church, uh, very much in many ways, except the bad ways, just like this church here. And so he's writing to the church to encourage uh, the church at Corinth. And uh, the reality is, uh, I mentioned this morning, has everybody noticed that the world is a mess? Everybody picked up on that? The world is a real mess. And so the, the problem that we have many times is we allow what's happening out in the world uh, to affect our spiritual lives. And uh, the world can be a real downer. It really can. And so the church at Corinth was fighting lots of different problems and difficulties uh, in, in the area where they lived. It was a very metropolitan area, but it was also a very sinful area. And so the more you cram people into, a, into, a, into an area, uh, usually the, the sin comes with it. And so there's lots of entertainment that's aimed towards sin. Let's be, let's be frank about it. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, he's encouraging them to, to what we call keep on keeping on. In other words, keeping on for the Lord. And, uh, and as time goes by, I think you've, you've realized that... Um, if you've been married for a long period of time, I use my wife and I for an example, we're going to be celebrating our 50th anniversary. I, as I mentioned this morning, I was wrong. She was not 10 when we got married, of course. Uh, that'd make her 62. She was 15, as I recall. So that's not quite as bad. But as time goes by, uh, if you're not careful, you can get used to uh, the surroundings and you can take them for granted. And so if you have people in this church that care for you at all. You need to realize that that's a rarity. That's becoming a rarity nowadays. And people who actually want to do something and live for the Lord, it's becoming more rare as we come to the, the last days of the last days. And so uh, the Apostle Paul, it's very obvious he's trying to encourage them to righteousness. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 24, this is what we read. He uses the analogy... Of, of runners, and actually boxers. Here he, start, he starts off, Know ye not that they which run in a race, next two words, everyone. Run all. Interesting. They run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, the word means self-control, is temperate in all things. Now they, meaning the people in the world, they that run, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we, we who are saved, he's talking about, an incorruptible, an incorruptible crown. That's what we as Christians should be running for. Verse 26 says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, 
when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so he starts off, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all. Let me just introduce this by, by way of saying those who are running in a race that he's talking about, he's probably alluding to, the, to what we would call the Olympics of, of those days, the people that would run in these, these races. And so what he was saying was they devote their entire lives to preparing for these races. They, you've heard this terminology before. They eat, drink, and sleep running. That's, that's, what, that's what happens when people have a goal. They devote themselves to it. Uh, over lunch today, we were discussing that uh, with the pastor's wife. Uh, when I was, uh, let's just say in the 1960s, when I was still in school, I was, I was the boy wonder in my junior year. Never, never stepped on the, on the racetrack before and, and just won all my races until the, the last race and I collapsed on the, on the track, and my career was over. But I was heading for the Olympics. The 1972 Olympics was, was the goal. And bang, it was, it was all over in a moment. But I ate, drank, and slept. Everything was about preparing myself for my goal. But we as Christians need to realize that our Christian life really should be eat, drink, and sleep exactly our goal. We need to immerse ourselves in our spiritual lives in the same way that what we call the, the serious runners, they prepare for, for the goal. And they're, they're striving to accomplish something. And of course, they're looking for the prize when it said uh, they're, they're up trying to obtain a corruptible crown in the Olympics, it's either like gold, silver, and bronze medals. That's, that's, it's a corruptible. Believe it or not, gold gets corrupted. That's why people still like it anyway, if you notice that. But that's what happens. People devote themselves, and it's called running all. Run all. Put yourself into, in this case for us, the Christian race. Because our Christian race is our journey. You hear people talk about my, my Christian journey, my spiritual journey. Well, our race is our journey in the Christ life. Let's bow for prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask for your help now. As you were with us this morning, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be comfortable being with us tonight. I pray that you'll help us all to yield to your Holy Spirit as he speaks to us through the preaching and the teaching of your word. And I ask that you would not only encourage all of us in our, our Christian race, but help us to be able to see it's still possible in this sin-sick world to live for Christ. And help us to be faithful until the end of our individual Christian races. May each life be benefited because they were here tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When we're looking at this particular passage, it's very obvious that Paul is saying, I don't know what you as the church at Corinth are going to do, but as far as I'm concerned, this is what I'm going to do. So I want each one of you to think individually. We're speaking kind of like generically for all of, all of the different churches in the, in the country, all the Christians in all the different churches, uh, but we're all supposed to run the race. But individually, I want you to think about whether you really want to run the Christian race or whether you just want to walk across the finish line. All of us are heading to a literal deadline. We've had friends, my wife and I were talking about it. Uh, we, have, we have lost more friends to uh, the COVID situation, the reality of that. And we don't know, we don't know when our deadline arrives. But we're, we're running our Christian race. We're either running it well 
if you're a saved person or you're not running it well. And so there may be some hindrances to you running the race. And so I believe God wants us to look at three things tonight that can help us in running our, our race. So remember, the analogy is running, like physically running. But in the spiritual analogy, the idea is everything really applies to our spiritual lives. So let's take a look at the first thing. If, if we're going to run the race and we're going to run all, we have to leave discouragements behind. Leave discouragements behind. Now I'm going to give you the illustration of what happened in, in, in my running career. The, when I ran the particular race that I ran, nobody else wanted to run that race. It's the half mile. It's, the, it's a grueling race. And so I, I ran it, and it was like, hey, I can do this. So the, the first race that I ran, I was in the lead until the last 100 yards. And I basically hit a wall, and everybody passed me. And I came in last. I started off, and I was first, and I ended up last. Now, you tell me. Was I discouraged, or did I just say, well, this happens in the best of families, evidently. Uh, no. It was very discouraging. And I had to leave that discouragement behind and ended up winning all the rest of the races for that whole year. And so leaving discouragements behind in the Christian life is also necessary. We have to be watchful for discouragements because of the events that have happened in our past. And we all have them. There's no temptation, no trial, no situation in life, as hard as it is to believe, but such as is common to man. The things that you say, why did these things happen to me? The answer is because they've happened to many, many others. And you and I are no exception to those things. When, uh, when my father died when I was 13 years old, I thought, why, why is this happening? What's with this? Uh, how is this going to do anything good? And then I realized the Lord allowed that so that just a few years later, I would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. It helped me to come to Christ. And, but at the time, what, what, what a discouragement. My, my mom and my sister and I were left by ourselves. No dad to take care of the kids. No husband to take care of my mom. And so those things are very discouraging. And every one of us here could stand and give testimony of discouraging things that have happened in our past. But as you've heard many times, it's what you do with those discouraging things that make all the difference in the world. Aren't you thankful that when the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees uh, turned their backs on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and hated him and plotted his death, Aren't you thankful that he didn't say, well, boy, that's really discouraging. Maybe I, maybe I shouldn't go through this. It's, maybe this is going to be tougher than what I thought it was going to be. Aren't you thankful that our Lord went through all the discouraging things that happened? And how about his knucklehead disciples who were always arguing about which one of us is the greatest instead of realizing that they were with the greatest? So all these things can be discouraging. So in in the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, in Philippians chapter 3, if you like to take notes or jot down the references, Philippians chapter 3, and we'll be looking at, at verses 13 and following. Philippians 3 and verse 13 and following. And he, had, he obviously had some discouraging things in his life. Did he not? <laughs> he had made a list of all the things that he had gone through, being beaten with rods and shipwrecked, and stoned to death, and then being able to revive, and all these different things, put in, being put in prison, all this stuff. And, but in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, <clears throat> here's what he had to say. Philippians 3 verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. We would say he hadn't arrived yet. But he said, This one thing I do. This one thing I do. And he uses uh, two participles. He talks about forgetting and he talks about reaching. But in this verse, brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, but this one thing I do. 
We could drop down to four, verse 14, and I'll just read it. Here's what he said. I press toward the mark. This is what I do. I press toward the mark. The mark is the goal. The mark is the finish line. He says, I press toward the mark, the goal, for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Everything that Christ has for me, that's what I'm pressing toward. I am pressing toward the mark of pleasing my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he says, he does two things. They're in the participial form here. He says, I, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. Forgetting those things which are behind. Those events in his life that could have been completely discouraging. He said, I'm forgetting those things. He was not dragging those discouragements from the past into today. Can you imagine what it would be like if you went back in your mind's eye? And let's see, most everybody is pretty young here, so you could only go back maybe 10 years. But 10 years or so, you go back in your past and say, here are all the discouraging things that happened. And I've got a list of them all made. And I'm still remembering those things because I'm sure there's a lot I can remember and, and a lot I can benefit from all of those discouraging events. And so people keep remembering those things. And after a while, it can become an insurmountable weight to be able to pull that thing along from day to day because you keep thinking of those things in the past that were, were discouraging. If things happen to you and you attempted to do things for God and something discouraging happened, and you keep remembering that, you're going to be discouraged from attempting to do anything else for God. Well, that didn't work, so I'm not going to let that happen to me again. I remember one day when knocking, knocking on doors, and, and uh, the guy opened up the door, and I said, Hi, my name is Ken Schaefer. I'm from the New Testament Baptist Church. He reached over, picked up a revolver, and said, I'm not interested, and pointed it at me. Now, may I just say, it was discouraging. It was, it was kind of discouraging. Uh, uh, but I took him at his word that he was not interested, and I said, okay, and I, I walked away. But what if I would have said, whoa, you know, that could happen again, and maybe the next time the guy's not going to tell me he's not interested, he's just going to show me that he's not interested. So maybe I ought not to do that again. It could be very discouraging. Now, I'm using that as an illustration because we all, all of you have had things that could discourage you from continuing on in your Christian walk, in your Christian race. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do this. And sometimes it's because we're letting all the people in the church be the ones that, hey, I'm, I'm serving the Lord because everybody else is serving the Lord. But then when they stop serving the Lord, then what are you going to do? It's discouraging when people that used to be church members, used to, used to, to serve the Lord, they, you, you would say they, they seem like such faithful people, and then they just fade away. They drift away. And it can be very discouraging. And, and we need to remember that. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. Take a, take a look at the list of all the things that the Apostle Paul experienced, and you'll realize every one of them would have stopped the heart of the strongest man <laughs> who was not depending on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, very quickly, what are some discouraging things that need to be left behind in order for you to run all? First of all, we need to think about your personal failures. Guess what? We've all failed in something. If you don't realize it, ask your spouse. They'll let you know usually. But what are some discouraging things that need to be left behind in your, in your life so that you can run on? Uh, there's no temptation, as I mentioned. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There's no temptation taking you. And the word means no trial that you've gone through, no situation in life 
but such as is common to man. The devil wants us to think that what we are going through is just so unique and that you have a right to be discouraged. You have a right not to run your Christian life and run all. You have a right to do that. But um, some people have said, how can God ever use me again? I've heard people say that. How can God ever use me again after what I've done? And I've realized the answer to that is simply, it's one of God's many specialties to use people who say, how can God ever use me again? Just my opinion that most Christians reach at least one or more points in their life where they ask themselves that question. How can God ever use me again? I made such a terrible decision. How can God ever use me again? When we think of the Apostle Peter, he denied the Lord Jesus Christ when the Lord needed him the most. I don't know the man, and he spoke with an oath. He spoke with an oath. In other words, he swore, he cursed. And the Apostle Peter, according to what we see, had this very thought, how, how, how can my Lord ever use me again? But when the Lord ascended from the grave, what did he, what did he tell the people? He said, get a message and tell Peter also that I've risen again. And that was God's way, of course, of saying, I can use you. It's one of my specialties. And the Apostle Peter preached the message on the day of Pentecost. Thousands of people were saved. How can God use me again? It's one of God's specialties. He can use all of us if we'll just submit ourselves to him. But sometimes it's not your own personal failures that can be discouraging. It can be the failures of others for whom you have respect. Or maybe you had respect and they failed you. It can include spouses. It can include friends. It can include pastors. It can include fellow church members. It happens in all the churches almost without exception. It happened in the church that I pastored for 40 years. Very, very discouraging. The failures of others can be devastating to your Christian life. I said it can be devastating to your Christian life if you allow it to be so. When you yield to the circumstances rather than yielding to the Holy Spirit, the circumstances will overwhelm you every time unless you yield to the Holy Spirit. A third thing is hurt feelings. Hurt feelings. I mentioned this morning, never, 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 never make decisions in your life when your feelings have been hurt and, and don't don't plan on doing anything just because of your feelings. I wrote down a couple things that people say. For a, ver a variety of reasons, people will have hurt feelings. Somebody said something. And remember, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Your words can kill or your words can bring life. Somebody said something, and it can destroy a church. It can destroy a person's life. How about, I can't believe they would ever do that. And my reply would be, believe it. They, they did it. But I, I can't believe that they said that. But they did say it. So the Apostle Paul had a lot of people saying a lot of bad things about him. But what, what should we do according to what the Apostle Paul said? He said, forgetting forgetting. Paul said, I keep on forgetting those things which are behind. Now, in a real practical sense, let's just, let's just remember, your brain's a computer. Does everybody know that factually your brain records everything that's ever 
that you've ever experienced. Your brain records everything, and there's still plenty of space left anyway. But, but what happens? We record all those things, and then amazingly, we can remember all the negative things that have ever happened to us, but we can't remember Jeremiah 33.3 unless we go back and look it up again. But we choose to remember certain things. And if we choose to remember those things, we're really not forgetting them. Okay, I'm going to just forget all those things. I'm, I'm just going to forget them all. No, they're still recorded up there. But you can choose not to remember them. Practically what happens? The, the old thought comes to mind. The old discouragement comes to mind. And you immediately have to say, Lord, I'm going to obey your word. I'm going to bring that thought into captivity. I'm not going to, be, I'm not going to allow myself to remember, remember it. I'm going to choose not to remember it. You say, well, that doesn't work for me. If the Holy Spirit of God is living within you, yes, it does work for you. And you say, well, why do I keep remember it, remembering it? You're going to not like this because you want to remember it. That's why, you, that's why you keep remembering it. You want to remember it, and sometimes it justifies for you why you're doing what you do. That's why people remember things that they ought not to remember. The, the thought justifies the way that they're living. So the word means to forget, neglecting to remember it, no longer caring about it, no longer caring about it. I'm not going to allow that anymore to disturb my Christian race. I'm, I'm not going to do that. And I can ask the Holy Spirit to help me, and he will. means forgotten, given over to oblivion. You give the situation over to oblivion. Well, who's that? Well, it's, it's not a thing. It's, it's, it's total forgetfulness. It's to oblivion. Boom, it's gone. I'm just not going to remember it anymore. And you say, well, I don't know if that, if that works. Well, it does. It's in God's word, forgetting those things which are behind. The Holy Spirit inspired the Apostle Paul to write this. We have it in what we call Holy Writ, the Word of God. And God is no respecter of persons. This did not just work for the Apostle Paul. It works for all Christians, forgetting those things which are behind. But at the same time, we ought not to make excuses for our own failures, our own past failures. I've learned, I just have to own up, okay? I said something, I made a decision. It was the wrong decision. When I, when I give an illustration in church, and it's, it's the wrong illustration, or I, I do not deliver the information, well, I do deliver the information as I studied it, then I find out later on that I'm wrong. My wife is, can testify to this. The next Sunday after I realized, oh, that was wrong, I said, I told you this, and it was wrong. It was wrong. I found out that this is actually the truth. And I want to make sure I, I didn't intentionally t not tell you the truth. I, di I didn't purposely give you disinformation. I'm, I'm making sure I correct it right now. So don't make excuses for your own past failures. Sometimes we make a mistake and we like to sweep it under the proverbial rug and, hey, nothing to see here, folks. But when we make a mistake, own up to it, change what needs to be changed, and as our pastor likes to say, press on for the glory of God. Don't let it keep you down. So forget about others' past failures. How is it helping you? And ask yourself it personally. How is it helping me to remember others' past failures? You know what the answer is. It's not helping me at all. So wh why should I do that? Remember that Satan, according to the Bible, is called the accuser of the brethren. Satan's the accuser of the brethren. So don't do his business of accusing others. Because when you remember, oh yeah, that person did this to me, you are accusing that person again. And especially in a local church, I'm certain that you can see 
the danger that is there. Because, folks, we need each other. And Satan knows that. So he wants to accuse the brethren to other brethren and try to bring a church down. A house divided against itself cannot stand, and Satan knows that very well. So if a runner was going to remember all of his past failures, can you imagine, is that any kind of motivation to try to run another race? Well, I've lost the last 100 races, but man, I'm really pumped for the next one. I don't think so. The same thing is true with our our Christian life. If, If we concentrate on all the failures, Satan will be very happy to bring those to your mind because he's tried to do it with me, and I'm pretty sure he tries to do it with you also. But not only did the Apostle Paul say he wants to leave these discouragements behind, <clears throat> forgetting those things, but we also need to, I call it, look not at distractions. Be watchful for discouragement, but be wary of distractions in the Christian life. Be wary of distractions in the Christian life. Now, he's talking about running all, and people who ran, they knew exactly what these distractions were. Any kind of race, whether it was chariot races and so forth, you had to be careful that you did, were not distracted by anything around you. With chariot races, you could, you could lose your life. With running, you would just simply lose the race because you could be distracted by, by people who, who, instead of running barefoot like some of them did back then, they would wear something that would make sounds when they, when they ran on the dirt so that when they came up behind somebody, the person in front of them could hear their foot, their, their feet hitting, and so the person in front would say, oh no, somebody's about to pass me, and they would turn and look. And that's why they came up with the, the rule for all runners now, never turn around and look at the person behind you. Your race is ahead of you, and we need to remember that too. Our race is ahead of us, so don't look at the distractions, be wary of distractions because a distraction will get your attention and we've heard it before how many of you are familiar with squirrel you raise your hand squirrel everybody okay at least some of the kids in the back squirrel a squirrel okay a little squirrel's running and little kids will say oh look at that squirrel in something they're easily distracted and evidently I must be a child because I'm still easily distracted (laughs) by big squirrels you know that wow that's really good squirrel look at the squirrel But distractions are just that. Where is the distraction leading you in your Christian life? Where is it leading you? Because that's the problem with the distraction. Where does it lead you? Now, all I'm going to do for the illustration, oh, my goodness. I I left it. I left it. Um, Mrs. Schaefer, would would you lift that up? Okay. Can everybody see what Mrs. Schaefer told me? Turn it around so they can all view it. Anybody see that? Um, if, I, if I were to tell you that if you're not careful, that can be one of the greatest distractions in your life, how many of you would believe me? Would you raise your hand? Do you, would you believe it? It can be one of the greatest distractions in your life. You don't have to spend hours traveling places. You can get there just about that fast if you know what to punch in. Oh, yes. This is a great, great view of Hawaii. And you can be there in a, in a moment, just like that. You can be distracted by, oh, look at the news. I, I start saying, why? Why look at the news? It's the same. They might as well say, all right, welcome to the latest edition of Bad News for Today, because that's what it basically is. Can, it, can the news be discouraging to you? Can it be a distraction? Oh, yes. It it definitely can. Now, Satan loves to distract Christians from running their race. So we have to keep the race in mind. You have to remember there is a finish line, and believe it or not, we're all going to make it to the finish line. We're going to die. But what we're doing up until that time, we can be spending our lives on distractions the world, the flesh, and the devil. There are plenty of things to distract. Well, why can't I have those things that are out in the world? Well, they, they may not be good for you. 
And then there are some good things. There are some good things to be involved with in the world. Some political involvement is helpful. Everybody should vote. I hope everybody understands that. Everybody should vote. Uh, as one person said, vote, vote, whether it's counted or not, vote. You know, that's, that's the way the attitude is sometimes. But too much political involvement can take you away from the things of God. Now, if God leads you, and the, the Lord can lead you into being a politician in the same way that the Lord can lead you into being a plumber. There are Christian plumbers. There are Christian politicians. You say, there are pretty few and far between, but there are. And if the Lord leads you there, that's fine. But I was a pastor when I was asked to be involved politically in what was called at the time the moral majority. Does anybody here even remember the moral majority led by Jerry Falwell? It was one of the things that helped Ronald Reagan to become the President of the United States. So you can tell how long ago that was. They gave me a stack of cards. Jerry Falwell gave me a stack of cards of people who were contributors to the moral majority. And he simply said, uh, this is, equates to $4,000 a month in support. This will help you to accomplish all the things. It will take care of all your bills, plus all the advertisements and all the work that needs to be done. $4,000 a month. It's the 1980s. I'm a beginning pastor. I'm making $29.07 a week plus house payment and utilities. Doing good. $4,000 a month in cards, in support. Um, it was kind of a little distraction here. Money can be a distraction. And I said, no. There were a lot of people that thought I was a moron, and maybe you would say the same thing, but it was a distraction. It was a distraction. Right at that point, there was a fork in the road. And if I would have gone down the wrong road, I would have been out of the ministry and probably involved in politics when the Lord had called me into the ministry. Now, each of you may have a situation in life <coughs> that is similar <coughs> in some way as far as a, as a distraction in your spiritual life. One of the ways that people are distracted, and, and think about this, don't be distracted by how others are running their race. I gave you the illustration of what happens when you put your eyes on somebody else's race instead of the one that you're running. You can look at somebody else's Christian life, and you might be tempted to say, I'm doing better than that person is. You can tell by, by just the little things that they say, they, they haven't matured in their Christian life as well as I have. Well, you've been distracted by that, and your pride kicks in. Did you know that God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble? Distractions can be dangerous in our Christian lives. And we ought to be saying what Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says. Hebrews chapter 12, the Apostle Paul, I believe, writing Hebrews, in chapter 12 and verse 2, he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What he was saying, this is literally means, keep on looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Why do you do that? Daily. You have to keep your eyes on the Lord daily. You have to say, Holy Spirit of God, lead me today. My wife and I many times will just say, Lead me each moment of the day. I cannot do without you. I must have the leadership of the Holy Spirit in my life. And folks, if you're saved, we're all in the same situation. We all need the leadership of the Holy Spirit of God. But when he's leading, we need to, you got it, we need to follow. And so he says, looking unto Jesus the definition of looking there is very interesting, and I think you can see the, the idea of distractions on the one hand and the Lord Jesus on the other hand. 
by just the definition of the word that the Apostle Paul used. Looking, it means to turn the eyes away from other things and fix them on something else. You can look it up in a concordance. Uh, when I looked at it, I thought to myself, isn't that exactly what the Christian life is all about? We have to constantly say, oh, there's a distraction. Wait a minute. I'm going to turn my eyes away from the distractions. I'm going to quit looking at the distractions that are available, and I'm going to fix them on something else. Or Let's make it somebody else, the Lord Jesus Christ. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So we might ask, well, why should we look unto Jesus? And there's a good reason. You, you say, well, wait a minute, it just says he was looking unto Jesus. Well, in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3, the Bible says, because for consider him that endured such contradiction. The word consider means ponder, ponder. Keep your, keep your mind fixed on Jesus Christ. Ponder him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. That's what happens. We, we faint and we're weary, but we faint in our minds first. We give up in our minds first. We get distracted in our minds first. We say, why should we continue on? And the, the short answer is, because the Lord Jesus Christ continued on. He went all the way to the cross for us. And it, it should motivate us to say, I'm going to run my race uh, to the end. To the end. I mentioned at the, at the, the, the lunch table today, uh, this is the year that I finish up three quarters of a century. That's 75 years. And I find myself, I'm, I'm quite proud of the fact that I made it possibly to three quarters of a century. But what I want to do is say, Lord, I don't want to just exist for 75 years. I want to be serving you in my 75th year. I want to be serving you. I, I want to be accomplishing something for the Lord Jesus Christ. As, as I grow older, as long as the Lord gives me strength. And we as Christians should say, hey, we're going to use our strength somewhere. We might as well use it for the Lord. Those, those of you who are, let's just say, we're more mature saints, we're older. <laughs> we, we realize there's only so much strength that you have for every day. How are you going to use it? A runner decides they only have so much strength, and when that strength is over, it's done. At the end of a race, you have expended all of your energy. When you get to the end of the race, you ought to be close to just being exhausted. When we get to the end of our spiritual race, wouldn't it be sad if, oh, we're very well rested and we walk into to heaven's gates, oh, yeah, didn't do too much for the Lord, but I'm really well rested as I come to heaven now. I, I want to be able to say I, I gave it all. And I believe the Apostle Paul was basically saying to the church at Corinth, run all. What are you saving your strength for? Is it for the world, the things of the world? Or are you using your strength for the Lord? And why look at others when we can look at the Lord Jesus Christ? So be wary of distractions. And then last, in your Christian life, if you are doing well in your Christian life, stay with winning ways. Stay with winning ways. Let me illustrate again. Uh, when I was running, I had kind of an unconventional way of running. My wife knows the story. My mother kno knew the story. She's in heaven now. My sisters who are still alive, they knew the story. Uh, I found out that when you run, if you have a finishing kick, how many know what a finishing kick is in a race? A finishing kick. My finishing kick was anywhere from 100 to 150 yards. And uh, 
I had an unconventional way of running. And so, but I won. So the idea is if you're winning and somebody says, well, you need to change the way that, <laughs> that you're running that race. Why? I'm, I'm winning. Why should I do that? If you're, if you're doing well, stay with winning ways. Now, runners know that as long as it doesn't kill you. Stay with the, with the winning ways. And in the Christian life, most of us are not going to kill ourselves by serving the Lord. But if you are running the Christian life, the Christian race, if you are doing well, stay with winning ways. I'd like you to turn to Philippians chapter 3. If you're still, if you're there already, it's just Philippians chapter 3 and verse 16. And spiritually speaking, he's, this is what he's saying. Nevertheless, where to we have already attained. Now remember, he said, I haven't apprehended yet. I haven't arrived and so forth. But he says, where to we have already attained. In other words, spiritually, the church at Philippi had reached a point. He had reached a point in his life. And he said, nevertheless, where to we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. What is he saying? The, the way that you've been living your Christian life, if it has helped you to attain to a place where you are more spiritually mature this year at this time than you were last year at this time, whatever you've been doing, keep on. Keep on doing the things that have helped you to attain a higher spiritual walk with the Lord than you had last year at the same time. If you are basically saying to yourself, I'm spiritually about the same this year as I was last year at this time. Well, then you, you might think this way. You know, if I have not matured in my Christian life, then I'm still the same baby that I was last year. I haven't grown. I haven't matured since that point. But the, this particular point of the message is, if you're doing well, stay with winning ways. If you are not doing well, you might consider some things need to be changed. So whatever you have done that has caused you to grow spiritually, stay with it. Stay with it. Uh, my wife and I, once again, I don't have my phone with me, but if I did, I would pull it out and say, uh, we use a program called Takarta. Uh, I think it's for old people, and I, I said, even though I'm not old, I'll use it. But Takarta, and, and it, it shows the scripture, and it reads it to you in an excited manner. It's, it's a narrative, and it's done really well. And I've noticed that that has helped me in my Christian walk. I like to just get up in the morning. My, my wife may still be asleep. I can sit at the table. I can listen to that quietly. And I need to do what I tell everybody else to do. Feed on the Word of God. Feed on the Word of God. Instead of checking the weather, you know, in the wintertime in North Dakota, why check the, winter, the, the weather channel? The weather's going to be bad. Just get over it and keep going. <laughs> but, but Takarda, the Word of God, is new every day. And so that's what, that's what we do. We use Takarda, and it helps us. So whatever you have done that caused you to grow spiritually, stay with it. Whatever point of spirituality you have attained, the Apostle Paul is saying, continue walking in the same way that got you there. Don't go backwards. That's the thought. Now, I want to give you an illustration. <clears throat> how many of you know how an athlete stays in shape? It's called in shape, staying in shape. Say, in shape, preacher. I've never been there. I don't know what it's all about. And, but, but, but the fact is, most of you know how an athlete gets into shape. And for the most part, the way that he got into shape, he or she got into shape, you just keep on doing the same thing that got you into shape. So if you have attained spiritually, like the Apostle Paul said, to a particular level, we need to keep on doing that same thing. Once you're spiritually in shape, keep doing the things that helped you to get spiritually in shape. Let us exercise 
the mind. Because all of our thinking it happens right up here. Continue thinking in the same way that got you where you are spiritually. In the book of Proverbs 23 and verse 7, you may be familiar with the passage. It says, as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's interesting the way it's, way it's presented, but it's letting us know something. As we think in our hearts, that's the way we are. The, the, the Lord put it this way, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Man speaketh out of the treasure of his heart. Whatever you're putting into your mind, it becomes part of your heart. And so what you think is what you become. As you think, so you are. So if you want to keep improving in the Christian walk, keep thinking on spiritual things and you will be a spiritual man or woman. And if you have not been thinking on spiritual things, start thinking on spiritual things and you will become a spiritual person. That's exactly how it works. So praying every day, and you know, did you remember to pray? You remember that song that we sang? Uh, did you remember to pray about this? Did you remember to pray about this? Did you remember to pray about this? The reason why those questions were asked in the song is because many times we have to answer the question, no, I forgot to pray. And maybe that's why the situation happened the way it was. Reading your Bible, as I mentioned. The, the social media has made it positive contribution in having the Bible on your phone. Where people said, oh, I, for, I forgot to bring my Bible with me to whatever place. In my opinion, nine times out of ten, most people nowadays, they didn't forget their phone. They, got, they, they, they have that with them. So we, we have the presence, the potential presence of the Word of God with us most of the time. And so whatever you've been doing to attain to a spiritual level, don't stop now. I'm realizing more and more that all of us are almost home to be with the Lord. We're closer to the coming of the Lord than we probably ever have thought. In verse 17 of Philippians chapter 3, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. Now what he was saying was, follow the right examples. Follow the right examples. Brethren, be followers together of me, he said, and mark them which walk so as you have us for an ensample. In other words, what's their track record? How are they doing? In running, you don't copy the pattern of the one who finished last. And spiritually, if you know people that you would sadly have to say, spiritually, they're losing the race. Don't follow their pattern. Follow the pattern of those who love the Lord, they're spiritually growing, Whatever good examples you have been following, don't change examples now. Ask yourself the question, where have the examples that you're following, where have they brought you to so far? If it's to a more spiritual place, keep following them. If not, it is time for you to change examples. Do your examples lead you to more love for the Lord Jesus Christ, more love for the work of Christ? Or do your examples lead you towards more love for the world and things of the world? It really is that simple. And so when we're thinking about these things, if, you, if, you were, if we're going to really run all, we're going to have to leave the discouragements behind. It's got to be a decision that you make. You have to be wary of the distractions that come into your life. Because if you're not, they will distract you and you never know where those distractions will end. And then, on the positive side, if you're on the top side in your spiritual race, stay with winning ways like the Apostle Paul. Let's all stand, if you would, please. I want us to consider these things. <clears throat> the invitation is quite simple. If the Lord is speaking to you, the altar is open.
If you want to bow the knee where you are and speak to the Lord, obviously that's available too. Heavenly Father, we ask that you'd help us as we ponder the things that we've heard tonight. And I ask for, on behalf of these people, that you would speak to each of our hearts and show us things that need to be changed and help us to be willing to change them. And Lord, would you also show to these folks the things that they're doing well that they need to keep on 